we all lead busy lives. But if we could just stop everything and take a bird's eye view, a little higher, there. Now we can see the multitudes. We are fueled by a shared vision to bring the name of Christ to those who have yet to hear. So we move forward to extreme places, corners of the world that have no access to the gospel. We train missionaries, send them out together, and pray that God's grace be known. We help the hurting, comfort the dying, give hope to the displaced, and have seen thousands come to faith in Christ. We are able to do so much more together than if we were chasing this vision alone. This is our common effort, together. Amen, we do what we do together. And isn't it good to be together? Uh, thank you uh, to the worship team, uh, that was good. Uh, blessed me, has blessed me to be here today. Uh, thank you Pastor David for allowing me this privilege uh, for allowing me the stewardship of this pulpit. I know that's something that rightfully so uh, your pastor takes very seriously. I enjoyed his reminder to me uh, this morning of that first conversation that he and I had a year and a half or two years ago at the annual meeting of the Louisiana Baptist Convention. And I, I walked away from that as I reflected back on it. I walked away from that uh, really appreciative to have had a conversation with a pastor uh, who takes the ministry seriously, who takes the word seriously, uh, who uh, obviously uh, takes very seriously the calling of God upon his life as an under-shepherd of the Lord Jesus uh, to uh, be a pastor. Uh, and uh, I'm incredibly encouraged by that. And I'm thankful that you have the privilege of having Pastor David and his family serving with you here at Jefferson Baptist Church, aren't you? I'm also thankful they have the privilege of serving here. Uh, it's been uh, a blessing to me just in the time this morning to get to know the church better. I knew the church by reputation, uh, but to get to know it better. And, and I appreciate you so much. Thank you for all that you do, not only sharing the gospel uh, here in Baton Rouge and uh, this part of uh, the, the state and the nation, but thank you for your reach literally to the very ends of the earth. As Pastor David mentioned, this church is incredibly supportive, generous in giving uh, to support uh, uh, your IMB missionaries uh, who are serving in over 130 countries of the world. Uh, and uh, because of your support of them, you send those missionaries out, you provide for their ministry needs. God is doing a great work. And in fact, I'm thrilled to be able to share with you today uh, that uh, uh, even in the midst of all of the depressing news about COVID and other events in the world, that God is using these days and the desperation and the uncertainty of these days, the fear of death uh, that swirls uh, the world over, God is using it to bring people to himself. Uh, in fact, it, through our missionaries, we have our missionaries report every year individually. How many people did you share the gospel with? Uh, how many people did your local Baptist partner share the gospel with? How many churches were planted through, through your work? Uh, and, and how many people came to faith? I was very concerned because of all the disruptions of COVID. Many of our missionaries have been displaced and uh, and, and we're in like severe lockdown situations in other countries. I was concerned that the impact would be much diminished uh, over the course of the pandemic than it had been prior. Actually, the impact grew during COVID. Uh, so in 2019, uh, we uh, saw about 12,000 churches, uh, excuse me, 15,000 churches planted overseas in 2020. That number jumped to 18,000 plus churches that were planted overseas. We saw uh, in 2020, in the midst of a global pandemic, more than 700,000 people had the opportunity to hear the gospel overseas through the work of your missionaries. And over 144,000 professed faith in Jesus as a result of having heard that good news. So. 
you are a part of that. As you pray for your missionaries, as you give to support them, as some of you have gone on mission trips and others will be going on mission trips, I hope again soon. Uh, and, and God may be calling some of you uh, to go plant your life among the nations or some of you students to spend a semester or a summer overseas uh, or two years at the end of your uh, college uh, uh, studies. Uh, all of those opportunities exist through the IMB, most of them fully funded uh, and it's because of the generosity of churches like Jefferson Baptist and churches across Southern Baptist Convention that that is able to happen. And I just want to stand before you today and say thank you. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing among the nations. Obviously, difficult days. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'm wondering some days, uh, uh, why doesn't God just take us on to heaven? Do you believe heaven's going to be better than earth? I'm, I'm convinced heaven is going to be better than earth. Uh, I have it on good authority. There are no Delta variants in heaven. Uh, no pandemics at all uh, have hit heaven. Uh, there, there's, uh, there, there's no presidential elections in heaven. I found that to be good news. That that's refreshing to think about. Uh, there's, there's no cancer in heaven. Um, there's no addiction in heaven. There's no depression in heaven. There's no death in heaven because heaven, well, it's heaven. And so why, why doesn't God just save us and when we're saved, take us on to heaven? Uh, why are we still here? That's really the question that I want to get at today. And, and, and to just sort of take the mystery out of it and, and to not make you wait until the end of the sermon to hear the answer. Let me, let me tell you why I believe God has left you here and left his church here. Why God doesn't just save us and take us to heaven? It's because heaven is not yet what heaven will be. And God has left us here in a part of his sovereign plan to allow us to have a role in making heaven what heaven will be. God's left us here with a job to do. Did you know that? And that job is... Well, in the big picture, a part of making heaven what heaven will someday be. We're able to see what heaven will someday be in a passage of Scripture in the book of Revelation. And I'm going to share that passage with you this morning. I'd invite you to turn with me if you have a Bible or a device you can click on. Or if not, then you can probably follow along on the screen. But we're looking at Revelation 7, two verses, verses 9 and 10. If you're familiar with the book of Revelation, then... Uh, then you know that much of what is contained in this book is, is a, a record of visions that God gave to one of his servants whose name was John. And, and some of the visions that John saw, visions from the Lord, allowed John to better understand the things that were happening in his world in his day. But some of the things God allowed John to see are things that I believe are happening in our day. Some of the things God allowed John to see are things that have yet to happen, but will happen because God's word is true and it always comes to pass. That's the category of what we find in Revelation 7 verses 9 and 10. John was able to see a picture of heaven, not as it was in his day, not as it is in our day, but as it will someday be. And this is what John says that he saw. After these things I looked, verse 9, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What an incredible vision John sees. What an incredible picture. Heaven as it will someday be. John says there's, there's a great multitude. You can't even number the people who are there. And they're from all the nations, peoples, tribes, and tongues of the world. That's heaven as heaven will someday be. And God has left you and me here on earth with a job to do, an assignment, a commission that he has given us. We have a, a part to play in heaven becoming what heaven will someday be. 
What does this mean for you and for me? Well, let, 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 let's get to that as, as we ask some questions of this vision that God allowed John to see and now that through God's word, we've seen. The first question I want us to ask together is who? Who does John see? As John looks into heaven, who does he see? Well, John describes it in verse 9. I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Now, when we stop long enough from the busyness of life, just take a pause from all that's going on, all the distractions around us to think much about heaven, uh, there are usually questions that come to my mind, probably yours as well. What will heaven be like? What, what will we be doing in heaven? What will it feel like to be in heaven? Who will be in heaven? What John answers, and the scriptures answer a lot of those questions, and certainly John answers that question, who, in the words we've just read. One of the things John makes clear is that heaven is inclusive. Now, heaven's not inclusive in the sense that everyone's included because we know that's not the case. The Bible says that in order to go to heaven, a person has to be saved. How are you saved? The Bible says when you have heard the gospel and believed the gospel, the good news that Jesus died on the cross as a payment for your sin, when you've believed that, when you've trusted in that, we call that faith. When you've when you've turned from your sin and turned to Jesus as your Savior, we call that repentance. And you've confessed Him as Lord because He is. The Bible says when that has happened in your life, then something incredible has happened that only God could do. God has saved you. Uh, you've been forgiven of all the wrong that you've ever done. You've been adopted into God's family. He is your Father. You have a home in God's kingdom, in heaven. But we know that it's simply not the case that everyone believes that good news about what Jesus did. Uh, some have heard it and rejected it. They won't be in heaven. Others haven't heard it. In fact, of the more than 11,000 people groups around the world, there are just about 3,000 of those people groups uh, that remain unreached with the gospel. And they're not only unreached, they're unengaged. And by that, I mean that as far as we know, there's no church there, uh, no missionary there, no one preaching or teaching the gospel to them. That's why the IMB exists in part is to get the gospel to those who have not heard. And we're, we're doing everything we can as we work together to get the gospel to the unreached and unengaged. Because we know that unless they have heard the good news and believe the good news, they won't be in heaven. And that's why you're here. That's why we're still here. We're still here because heaven's not inclusive in the sense that Everyone will be there, but heaven is inclusive in the sense that someone will be there from all the tribes, not some of the tribes, not part of the tribes, not a lot of the tribes, not most of the tribes, all of the tribes will be represented in heaven. All of the peoples, languages, and nations will be represented in heaven. They aren't yet, and that's why we're still here. Until the who are there, we still have work to do here. Is God calling you to be a part of this work? You betcha. We all have something to do. We, 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 we can pray for those who are lost, whether they're in our own family, in our community, for the billions among the nations. We've been called to do that. We can send missionaries to those who have yet to hear. We can support them uh, through our giving, through the, uh, the stewardship of our financial resources. We've all been expected to do those things. But some of us, God is calling to go. Is God calling you to spend a summer or a semester? Is God calling you to spend two years? Is God calling you to go as a career missionary to plant your life among an unreached people group and share with them? Is God calling you to use your retirement years to be a part of this work going? 
God is calling you. Don't delay. Every single day, 155,473 people die lost. There's no time to waste. Answer God's call. Until the who are there, we have work to do here. Let's ask another question. Who? Now let's ask where. Well, we're talking about heaven, right? But John is very specific as he describes what he's seeing in the vision, where the people are. I looked at great multitude, the who, which no one can number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, where? Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. John sees this great crowd of people that you couldn't even number. And he says they were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They're in the very presence of the God of heaven. Uh, they're in the very presence of the Savior who died for them and who has risen from the dead. Uh, they, they are seeing as they've been seen. They're knowing as they've been known. What a, what a powerful, incredible picture. What will it be like to be there? John's words remind us of a kingdom that's not of this world. A house, the Bible says, not made with human hands. Jesus in his final hours before his betrayal and crucifixion had gathered with his disciples in the upper room. They were in Jerusalem. The disciples were wondering, why are we here? There are people who want to kill him here. Uh, he was saying uh, things that they were confused by and, 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 and worried about. And, and in John 14, we find a record of how Jesus responds to them. Knowing that they were so troubled and confused, he said, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, are many rooms. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that you may be where I am also. I'm looking forward to being in the Father's house, aren't you? Which reminds me, thank you. Uh, for building a house. My wife Michelle and I had the opportunity to see a house that you helped build. You helped fund the construction of a new house. Uh, we traveled to Uganda just before COVID hit. And, and one of the things that we were able to see was this house that, that those of you who give and support the church and support the cooperative program as you give through the church or give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, you're a part of that. Now, I, I must admit that in these days when like real estate, I assume it's kind of the same here as it is where we're living up in Virginia. It's, it's off the rails. I mean, people are paying ridiculous prices for houses. They've, they've skyrocketed and in, 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 in the availability of them is, is, is very... It, it, location, location, location. That's the real estate slogan, right? Uh, well, l let, me, let, me, let me just say you could have chosen a better location <laughs> if you're concerned about house values because where you built this house was actually uh, in a refugee settlement. Uh, the house doesn't look much like my house, probably doesn't look much like your house. It's not a very large house. In fact, uh, just like the front of the stage here is, is, is uh, the full dimensions of the house, probably the house is, is divided in the center into two rooms. So there's just two small rooms in the house. It is built of brick. There's a tin roof on the house. Uh, there's no plumbing in the house because remember, you chose to build this in a refugee settlement and there's, uh, there's no water lines and no sanitation, sewage uh, uh, lines there. And, and so that, that's not, no, no one running water in the house. There's no electricity in the house uh, because there's no power grid. There's no electric lines. Electricity isn't available out there in the refugee settlement. And, and uh, yet it's, it's, it's who lives in the house that I found uh, to be most interesting. There's a 16-year-old boy lives in this house and his four younger siblings. There's no father who lives in the house. There's no mother who lives in the house. It's what we call a child-headed household. 
It's really a miracle that those kids live in the house. It's a miracle they're alive. You see, they're not from Uganda. They're from South Sudan. If you're not aware of the history of South Sudan, over the last couple of generations, war and genocide has plagued that country. Millions have died, including the parents of this 16-year-old boy and his younger brothers and sisters. Somehow, I have no idea how, somehow he managed on foot to get from South Sudan into Uganda and bring his four little brothers and sisters with him. They wandered into the refugee camp there with nothing, just a few rags on their back, nothing else. And that's where a young missionary family who you support, as you support the IMB, one of your missionary families learned about these five kids. They went out and met with them, saw the needs, and immediately began a construction project, building them a house. Uh, food was brought to the house as soon as it was finished. It didn't take long to build a house like that. Uh, no wiring, no plumbing. Put that up pretty fast. All of their basic needs were met. And then, these five orphans were told about a father who loves them and who wants to adopt them. And he is a king. And for all eternity, he has promised to care for them and to meet their every need. Thank you for loving orphans and refugees who you've never met on the other side of the world and for sending people to share Christ with them. Until the who are there the who from all the nations and tribes and peoples of the world, we still have work to do here. And that's why we're here. Now, let's ask the next question. The next question is how? How, how is it that you're able to be there? How is it you, you get there? Well, uh, John uses some symbolic language here in the end of verse 9 that, that I want to call to your attention this great multitude no one can number from all the nations tribes peoples and tongues they're standing before the throne before the land listen to this next phrase they're clothed in white robes clothed in white robes I believe it's literal I believe that we'll literally be clothed in white robes in heaven but it's also very symbolic uh, what does it symbolize well the Bible says that of you and of me that we were born dead in our trespasses and sins the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, all means all, and so all means you, and all means me. We, we've all done things that are wrong, right? The Bible says that when we sin, we become slaves to sin, and that the wages or the reward of our sin, our wrongdoing, is death, which includes hell, eternal separation from God. So how is it that those who are stained with guilt and sin can be in heaven and clothed in white robes? Well, that's, that's the how of salvation. It's, it's the how that happens because Jesus came and gave his life to pay the price of our sin. And, and, and those who have heard and believed the good news of the gospel and trusted him, well, we sang about it. Uh, there is a river of gladness that pours from Emmanuel's veins, uh, the sinner plunged beneath the sinner was plunged beneath and got saved those those were the lyrics of the last song that we sang there's some older hymns uh, that express it in a, a similar but slightly different way what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again there's a fountain filled with blood it's drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty what stains in Christ we find forgiveness, we're made whole, we're made pure. We have hope and everlasting life. Although I want to tell you this morning about two individuals who have never heard the gospel, but I believe that they've been forgiven, been saved, and be in heaven. Now you say that sounds a little strange, especially in light of everything that you've said about how we're in heaven. But bear with me just a moment. These, these two individuals uh, heard the gospel in a unique way. In fact, they didn't even hear the gospel. In Nashville, Tennessee, we have a 
a training school for deaf missionaries and missionaries to the deaf. Did you know you don't, you, you can be a missionary to the deaf, even if you're not deaf? Just as you would learn the language and, and culture of any peoples you want to reach with the gospel, you can learn the culture of deaf people and you can learn sign language so you can communicate with them. And we have, we have dozens of deaf missionaries and missionaries to the deaf who are serving all over the world, reaching the millions of deaf peoples who are lost and who no one else is going to share the gospel with. This training school in Nashville was a place where a man showed up who was originally from Indonesia and he went through the training. When he finished the training, uh, because of the pandemic, he wasn't able to do what he had planned to do and that was travel to Indonesia and share the gospel with some of his deaf friends there. But he invited them to join him on a Zoom call and he shared with some of his deaf friends who were still in Indonesia for an hour the gospel and his testimony in sign language. And at the end of that hour, two of his deaf friends from Indonesia indicated they believed what he had shared with them. And they were ready to put their trust in Jesus. And they acknowledged that in a prayer. We've connected them to a local church in Indonesia. They're being discipled, being baptized. And that's how two deaf people who have never heard the gospel, because they've never heard anything, I believe will be in heaven. Because they came to understand the gospel through sign language. Church, you don't have to go far outside of these doors to find hearing or deaf. And there are billions of them around the world. And the reason we are here is because God has left us here to share the good news with them. So the who can be there through salvation. Final question this morning. So what? So what? Now, it's not the so what my teenage daughter asked because that's not a question. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's a statement. So what? Not, not, not that kind of so what. The so what I'm, I, 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 I'm talking about, this kind of so what. So what, Lord, does this mean for me? What would you have me do? You, you've allowed me through, through your word to see heaven as it will someday be. What do you want from me? Let me see if I can answer that question in a personal way. On a weeknight at a Baptist church, a little town in the mountains along the Tennessee-Kentucky line, there were a couple of church members showed up in the church parking lot because it was church visitation night. And those church members uh, did what they had come to do. Uh, they set out walking from the church, walking through the little neighborhoods in the little town, knocking on doors, inviting people to come to church. At some point in the evening, they made their way up to a little rental property at 210 Province Street. Stepped up on the porch and they knocked on the door. There was a young man in his late 20s who came to the door. I'm not sure if they knew about his circumstances. It was a small town. They might have known. He was recently divorced. He was a father of three he was raising three little boys on his own. At the time, they would have been ages three, four, and six. They might have known that about him. They had no way of knowing that the future president of the International Mission Board was the four-year-old somewhere in the house. But what they did know was their neighbors needed to hear the gospel. Broken families needed to find help and hope and healing in God's family. And so they'd gone out to issue an invitation. My father accepted their invitation. The next Sunday, somehow got three little rowdy boys ready and took them to church. A few years passed, and there was another knock at our door one evening, and this time it was our pastor, Pastor Allen. He'd come at Dad's invitation, and he sat down in our living room, and he shared the gospel with my older brother, who had been asking questions about what it would mean for him to give his life to Jesus. My younger brother and I, we sat in the floor, and we listened as Pastor Allen explained to my older brother what it means to be saved. 
Pastor Allen got three for one that night as the three of us surrendered our lives to Jesus, put our trust in Him, and we're saved. We were baptized a few weeks later together in the baptistry of the little First Baptist Church of Jellicoe, Tennessee. How thankful I am for church family who knew people in their community needed to hear the gospel for two Baptist laymen who showed up to make visits for a pastor who had his own family and lots of ministry demands, I'm sure, but came and sat down in my living room and shared the gospel with me and with my two brothers. How thankful I am for this church and for all that Jefferson is doing to to reach this community with the gospel. Again, you don't have to go far outside of those doors and across that parking lot before you find hundreds, even thousands of families that are broken and hurting, lives that are desperately lost, that have no hope apart from them coming to know Christ. And it's for them that you're here. And it's for the billions around the world who have yet to hear and no one has yet to even go to them to share that you're here. Don't forget why you're here. Let me invite you to stand. As we come this morning to a time of commitment, It's good to remember that those who are in heaven are worshiping in verse 10. They're crying out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And it's a salvation that He wants you to have. The Lamb of glory has died to take away your sin and the sins of the world. If you would put your trust in Him today, turning from your sin and repenting, turning to Him, acknowledging Him as Savior and Lord of your life, you will be forgiven. You will be saved. If that's the commitment you're making with your life, then we want to be able to celebrate it with you and to rejoice that you're being welcomed into God's family. Pastor Dave will be standing here at the front as we sing in just a moment. You come down and share that news with him. Maybe you have questions. What, what does that take? What does that mean for me? He can answer those questions. Would you come? Maybe God is not calling you to come. He's calling you to go. And today you're ready to answer that call. He's laid the nations on your heart. And today you're ready to say, here am I, Lord, send me. If that's the case, you come. I'll be here near the front. Barry Calhoun is here as well. One of my associates at the IMB. We would love to talk with you and to get you connected. So you can understand how God could use you as a missionary. It's not my invitation this morning, though. It's not Pastor David's. It's, well, it's the Lord who invites. Come to Him. And then come share it with us as we sing.